In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything was perfect, and the crowning glory of creation, Adam and Eve. They were created in the very image of God, but Adam and Eve brought death into the creation as they deliberately disconnected from God in a mistaken attempt to become autonomous. In reaching to become more than man, Adam and Eve fell to become less. God tells fallen Adam and Eve that they have lost their place in Eden. However, even here at the beginning, God has plans to restore Adam to full connection to God, one another and the creation. And we read from Genesis chapter 3. The Lord, the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God chose Abraham and his family to represent all humanity and to be the crucible of the Incarnation. Thus began the miraculous journey of redemption. The first two generations to be born to Abraham and Sarah were miraculously conceived, setting the template for all those who would be called children of Abraham. Through his family, all the families on earth would be blessed. And we take up our story in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native land, your relatives and your father's home, and go to a country that I am going to show you. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you 
and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you. And through you, I will bless all the nations. When Abram was 75 years old, he started out from Haran, as the Lord had told him to do, and Lot went with him. And then further in Genesis chapter 21, the Lord blessed Sarah as he had promised, and she became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham. When he was old, the boy was born at the time God had said he would be born. Abraham named him Isaac. And when Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. Sarah said, God has brought me joy and laughter. Everyone who hears about it will laugh with me. Then she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I've, I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew, and on the day that he was weaned, Abraham gave a great feast. <laughs>
Isaiah was a prophet who spoke the word of God to the people of God in a time of great distress and exile. He looked forward to a time when all that was lost would be restored, when Israel would receive a king who would fulfill all that the prophets had foretold. He would be a king like no other, and his kingdom would last forever and be for all nations. And we read the words of Isaiah from chapter 7. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And then over a couple of chapters in chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. At every significant moment in the history of Israel, angels were agents of the news. For the Jews, the announcement of divine purpose was put beyond question when it came through the actions of angels. And the Advent story is abounding with angels. We continue our story in 
the book of Luke. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to a town in Galilee named Nazareth. He had a message for a girl promised in marriage to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of King David. The girl's name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Peace be with you. The Lord is with you and has greatly blessed you. Mary was deeply troubled by the angel's message. And she wondered what his words meant. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. God has been gracious to you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will make him a king, and his ancestor David was, and he will be the king of the descendants of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, I am a virgin. How then can this be? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and God's power will rest upon you. For this reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. Remember your relative Elizabeth. It is said that she cannot have children. But she herself is now six months pregnant, even though she is very old. For there is nothing that God cannot do. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it happen to me as you have said. And the angel left her.
Before time, God the Father dwelled with the Son. In the age of the Old Testament, God dwelled with his people in tent and temple. But now in Jesus Christ, God dwells with us as one of us. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. We turn to the words of Matthew in chapter 1. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The King of Kings, the Lord of Glory, entered humanity humbly. He became two cells in the womb of the Virgin Mary and was born in a shed at the back of a pub and laid in a food trough. He truly was one of us. Our story continues in the second chapter of Luke. At that time, the Emperor Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the Roman Empire. When his first census took place, Quinarius was the governor of Syria. Everyone then went to register himself, each to his own town. Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the town of Bethlehem in Judea, the birthplace of King David. Joseph went there because he was a descendant of David. He went to register with Mary, who was promised in marriage to him. She was pregnant. And while they were in Bethlehem, she, the time came for her to have her baby. She gave birth to her son, wrapped him in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger. There was no room for them to stay in the inn.
The grand announcement of the greatest event was declared in the most unlikely place to the least of men. This was good news for the ordinary people living in all the ordinary places all over the world. And we continue with our reading from Luke. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. The good news is bad news for the kingdoms of this world. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but this king and his kingdom and his power and glory will last forever and ever. Amen. We take up our story again in the book of Matthew. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the time when Herod was king. Soon afterwards, some men who studied the stars came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the baby born to be the king of the Jews? We saw his star when it came up in the east, and we have come to worship him. And further in the chapter, So Herod called the visitors from the east to a secret meeting, 
and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem with these instructions. Go and make a careful search for the child, and when you find him, let me know, so that I too may go and worship him. And so they left, and on their way they saw the same star they had seen in the east. When they saw it, how happy they were. That What joy was theirs. It went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. They went into the house, and when they saw the child with his mother Mary, they knelt down and worshipped him. They brought out their gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh, and presented them to him. <laughs> Jesus the Word was with God in the beginning. In the Incarnation that Word became one of us and was with us. He was God with us and us with God. In Him heaven and earth overlapped. Now we have hope that we too will be adopted into the household of God and become the children of God. 
and we read words from the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth.
Well, good morning. It's our third Sunday in Advent, and I've got to say Advent is an incredible season in the church calendar. Now, most people, when they think of the gospel, they think of the death and resurrection of Jesus, which was absolutely necessary thing. The Easter time uh, message is a powerful, important message. But Advent is really what the good news is all about. It's about Jesus being the true king, the king, the ruler, the one that God has chosen to um, establish the kingdom of God on earth. And the gospel that uh, Jesus preached when he began his preaching ministry was about the kingdom of God. And the gospel that the first Christians began to take out into the world was that Jesus is the true Messiah and the kingdom of God has come in him. And the ultimate fulfillment of that kingdom will come at the second advent when Jesus comes to wrap up history in all of its completion. And so for that reason, I've entitled today's message, Advent is the good news. Advent is the gospel. And so we see what the true gospel really is in this Advent season. Um, now, it's really interesting. If you do a little digging around in human history and in uh, literary history, what you'll discover is there is a whole plethora of stories that at the core of them is about the rise and return of a good and noble monarch who would ultimately re-establish the fortunes of a particular region or a country by ousting the former evil overlords and restoring justice to the realm. You, you, think, of it, you think of all the stories that you've read from fairy tales to, to uh, modern movies, things such as, uh, or stories such as Robin Hood or The Lion King or Lord of the Rings or King Arthur and his knights or Snow White, Star Wars and many other stories too numerous to mention. But what is common about them all is that they have as their theme the re-establishment of the true king and therefore uh, justice being restored to the kingdom. And so that story is embedded, I believe, in the human heart. It's in the human soul and it's in every culture in the world. And that is because each one of us is longing for the day when true justice will be done on earth and when and when um, the things that we know deep down in our souls are meant to be happening on this earth and in creation ultimately do actually happen. And so this uh, same aspiration is inherent in all of our political daydreams as well. We always uh, are on the lookout, hoping forever for the eventual rising of the perfect system of government that will bring evil to its knees and bring justice to all. And I believe it's this is the fundamental reason why our folklore, our fairy tales and our political fantasies are all populated with stories of a just and a noble king or queen who will one day rightly rule the world and bring justice for all. Um, ever since, however, our collective rejection of God's authority and our fall into autonomy through Adam and Eve, we've only succeeded in producing a never-ending parade of rulers who fall short of what we instinctively know ought to be done. And just to say over the last 100 years, we've seen the rise of fascism and communism, socialism, capitalism, westernism, Islamism, liberalism, and all the other isms. And all of these isms are an attempt to bring a just kingdom to the world. And each of them have had their day in the sun but each of them have ultimately led to disappointment and in many cases to outright dismay. But hope springs eternal in the human heart and we never seem to lose confidence that the next king will be the answer to our longings. You know, even now, there are many who believe that we just need to tweak liberalism or socialism a little bit and everything will be okie dokie. I believe I can confidently predict that no amount of tweaking is going to do the trick. In any case, even if we did somehow, by some miracle, produce a perfect political system, death would eventually render that system invalid. We, ha we might have a perfect king, but that perfect king would die inevitably. Or we might set up a perfect system, but then the next generation might destroy it. Um, and so death would still end up making a mockery even of our self-sufficiency and our attempt to create instability or to create stability for the future. Death creates instability and causes a wobble to take place and to throw it off. 
Um, and, uh, and what of justice for all of those who lived under tyranny in the past? How do they get justice unless there is the resurrection, unless there is an overcoming of death? What that means is we need God to be king and we need to see the end of all forms of evil and we have to see death overcome. Not just death for the future, but death in the past needs to be put right. And so resurrection is the ultimate uh, necessity for a good and perfect kingdom and a good and perfect king. And of course, that is what the good news is all about. The good news is that God has sent the perfect king to us in the form of his son, who's become one of us in the incarnation. And he has shown and demonstrated his kingdom in his earthly life uh, in his first advent. And ultimately, he has proved the authenticity and the validity of his claim through the resurrection, his overcoming of death. And we look forward to the ultimate demonstration and the power of the kingdom coming in the second advent. And that is what Advent is really all about. That's what all our carols are about. That is what the great songs that surround this season point us to. And, you know, it's much more than just a sentimental time or a time of uh, thinking thinking nice thoughts about uh, small children and fairy animals. No, it's got to be bigger than that. This is a cosmic event. This is for all people. And it is a political statement as well as a spiritual statement. Uh, We must get away from this idea that the Christian faith is simply about how to order your spirituality and to get a new kind of religion going, uh, sort of an additive to your life or an insurance policy for life after death. It's so much more than that. the, The advent is the story about how God has become king in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means, uh, or that that has implications, I should say, not just for the hereafter and not just for our spiritual lives, but it has implications for our daily lives, for our political aspirations, for justice on earth, for for, um, um, health, for, for every aspect of life, education, you name it. The kingdom of God is the answer to all of the questions that we have for justice and for goodness to, to, um, to be spread across the world. So Advent is all about the appearance of the long-awaited true king, the one upon whom everything depends and relies. And the good news is that Jesus is the true Messiah, He is the Christ that God has always intended to be the authentic and true king who will bring real justice and everlasting goodness to the world. And the proof of this authority and the validation of this is the resurrection. That is an encapsulation in a very short one sentence summary of the good news. And so Jesus, he is the same one that Isaiah prophesied about saying, for to us a child is born To us, a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders. Can you notice what that's saying? It's saying that all authority, true government will be on him. He will carry that mantle and he shall be called wonderful counselor, which is another way of saying a wise and true king. He will be mighty God. So he will rule as God, not just as a mere human being. He will be the everlasting father. That's a messianic title. A good king will be like a father is to his children. He'll be the prince of peace. In other words, he'll bring warring to an end. He'll bring the tribes to become one people. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. This is Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Famous passage, but the implications of it are for everyone and for all time. It's not just... A religious thing, not just a spiritual aspiration. This is political. This is for all humanity and it is for all time, past, present and future. And uh, the sentiment of all this is, is captured perfectly in the Hallelujah Chorus. Just, just do yourself a favour. Get online onto YouTube or something like that and watch the Hallelujah Chorus being sung in all its splendour. And what it will show you is in a in a very beautiful way exactly what this good news is all about but i've quoted part of it here 
The, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, and he shall reign forever and ever. That is what is going to occur at the second advent, that Jesus will reign forever and ever, but he established his kingdom in the first advent and he underscored it with his resurrection, showing that he is the true king, that not even evil or death could stop him. And he is the one upon whom our hopes can be given unreservedly. And that's what faith ultimately is. Faith is giving our allegiance to this true king and throwing in our lot with him and saying, as for me and my household, we're going to serve this king. That is what faith really is. And this is good news because Jesus is a good king. He's the kind of king that everyone has been desperately hoping for. You know, there have been many pretenders to the throne in the form of governments and philosophies and religions and political ideologies and powerful personalities. But the true Messiah is Jesus Christ and his authority has been established. This is the good news. Amen.